Okay, so welcome uh, to, um, uh, to everyone who uh, is uh, here at this part of the uh, day's events um, as we celebrate um, both the uh, achievements of uh, some of our best and brightest, uh, celebrate uh, with, um, with BALSA, our Black Law Student Association, uh, taking advantage of um, a February and a series of uh, festivities uh, that we hope mark moments of uh, pride in uh, the life of Osgood, in the history uh, of Osgood, and of course in the bright future uh, of Osgood and York University. Uh, this uh, comes on the heels of some other events today that uh, you'll be hearing about, uh, which um, speak to that sense of uh, connecting the generations. And uh, this has been as many of you know, a poignant um, uh, year for us uh, here at Osgood and in the community, uh, marking uh, the uh, tremendous achievements uh, and also the passing of Lincoln Alexander and uh, Leonard Braithwaite. And so it's a reminder of a couple of things that I think will be a theme linking together the various um, uh, remarks today and certainly something that Justice uh, Michael Tulloch, who we're incredibly honored uh, uh, to have with us today uh, has uh, shared as well, and that uh, sense both of the shoulders that we all stand on in our lives and certainly in the life of an institution uh, like, um, uh, like Osgoode Hall Law School, uh, but also this um, uh, double-edged sword, right? The story of incredible uh, challenge to be uh, getting a legal education at that point in time and making possible so many other achievements for those who followed. Uh, but also uh, a recollection of exclusion and of an institution that wasn't just uh, built on the strength of our diversity as we celebrate today, but also uh, on the struggles it took uh, to get there. And I think we're hopefully marching towards that tipping point where we move from those who've broken through barriers to become the first who did this or the first who did that to the others who follow in their wake to a point in time where it's not about uh, a minority status anymore for anyone, but about every single student, uh, staff and faculty member who's a part of this community feeling ownership over it, feeling it's about them, it's here for them, and it's gonna make possible the change and difference that they're gonna make uh, in uh, the community and in the world, and that's, uh, I think, what, uh, what we're all uh, about. So. Today uh, is particularly special for me uh, because it's not um, an event that Osgoode Hall Law School has uh, put together uh, under our steam. It's an event that our students have put together and an initiative that very much is a part of joining with that leadership uh, to hopefully make sure that it uh, has the support it needs and that the students know uh, that uh, they are the leadership of this university and of this law school and so it's with uh, special um, uh, pride that I'm here to welcome you as a Dean of Osgood, but very much to this BALSA event. And I would uh, normally want to thank some individuals um, uh, within uh, the BALSA organization who made it possible, but I'm too nervous to do that, that I'll leave out someone who is absolutely central. Uh, so we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll instead make sure uh, that that's uh, done by um, uh, Camille or Oinken or one of the uh, students who's going to be speaking to you, but uh, it really has been a collaborative uh, effort and uh, one that again is um, uh, filling us with pride. Uh, but as I said, uh, Osgood joins with um, uh, York University uh, today in celebrating one of our own, and I purposely haven't focused as much on the York end as I normally would uh, because we are honored uh, today to have the president of York University, uh, Mamdou Shukri, uh, with us to offer his welcome uh, for this event. Uh, and it goes uh, without saying too often, so I will say it, uh, just how fortunate Osgood is to be at York, how much we feel a part of this community, uh, and how much uh, together we are stronger uh, than uh, Osgood uh, ever was on its own, or that York ever would be, uh, but for having uh, our community within it. So, uh, Mamdu, if you'll come up, and please join me in welcoming President Shukri to offer his remarks. Thank you very, very much, uh, Lauren, and uh, on behalf of the entire university, I'd like to welcome you to this very uh, important and exciting uh, event. Uh, I was actually particularly thrilled to learn that the uh, Black Law Student Association here at Osgood uh, were hosting this particular event in honor of some of York's distinguished alumni uh, during Black History Month. 
as a university uh, president, I'm always really proud of this particular university because this is a university with very strong moral values. Values like equity, social justice, social responsibility, accessibility, and fairness. These are values that we just don't talk about. These are values that we believe in. These are values that we live every day of our lives. These values have shaped who we are as a university and have also shaped our students, how our st students have become. One of the things that I find so fascinating at York is what, what makes us very special is the fact that we are really an international university. Speaking of diversity, York is the model for diversity. Some of you may be tired of hearing me saying these statistics. We are a community of 65,000 student, faculty, and staff. We have 250,000 alumni. Put them all together, they can trace their background to more than 170 countries in the world. You can't be more international and more diverse than that. This diversity exposes our students to a high level of differing opinions and points of view on all issues studies, be it academic, political, economical, or whatever. It exposes our students to incredible diversity of opinions, opinions that are based on different set of, uh, of beliefs. And while we are quite diverse in our experiences, backgrounds, and identity, we also share many similarities which aren't inherently visible. By learning within such a, a diverse community and from some of the best professors that any university can offer, our students gain better understanding of the world in which they live. They go on to become what I always call citizens of the world. I've said that repeatedly. Universities in the 21st century, their job is to train citizens of the world. And really, we need to look to look no further than our own incredible alumni that are being celebrated here today, like Michael Tullock. Who is Michael? Here he is. Well, we are very proud of our alumni and particularly proud of people like, like Mike, who is uh, a York grad, an Osgood uh, uh, grad, who is himself very proud of his alma mater. We're, I'm very pleased, given, having the opportunity to meet you and uh, get to know you in the last few years since, my, since I came to York. Uh, I'm so proud of this relationship and I know the extent of your commitment uh, to York University. Of course, I would remiss if I don't mention Sheldon Levy, president of our sister university, Ryerson, who is here today. Now, although we're always proud to uh, uh, receive presidents of other universities, however, Sheldon is here also because he I would say everything he learned, he learned here at York. Many of you may not know that uh, he has worked for York uh, for so many years. So as such, for newcomers like myself, uh, many of the values that I brag about and I'm proud of, people like Sheldon Levy had uh, uh, contributed to make this university the way it is. So I'm glad to see you here. Of course, uh, at the, at, at last but not least, I would like again to congratulate Osgood's Black Law Students Association for organizing this event, and I wish you a great event this evening. Thank you. Thank you, President Shukri. And on behalf of the Black Law Students Association, thank you all for coming. My name is Camille Dunbar. This is Oinka Akinyele, and we're both the co-presidents of the Black Law Students Association here at Osgood. In particular, thank you, Justice Tulloch, for joining us today. We look forward to today's events. And as you all may have noticed, the stage is a bit um, decorated, we'll put it that way, um, with some musical gear for our student mock trial band. We won't be having any musical talent today, unfortunately, so hopefully you weren't looking forward to that. Um, but we are preparing for a student talent show that's coming up later on this week. Camille and I are truly humbled to be part of this event today. We truly believe that we are actually walking on the shoulders of giants who came before us. To think that Lincoln Alexander himself walked the halls of a slightly different Osgood 50 years ago is truly a humbling experience. And to think that 50 years later, there's about 17, 18 of us in our graduating class, the class of 2013, it truly humbles us and makes us really appreciate those who came before us and those in 
whose paths we follow today. So we created this award, um, the award that we're going to give out today, and we named it after Lincoln Alexander just to honor one of the greatest Canadians that made this country a better place to live. And not just this country as a whole, but to be honest with you, made the world probably a better place to be. So with that, I would like to introduce Rochelle Smith from Crawford Adventist Academy, who is going to sing Amazing Grace. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a lot of you know the history behind the, so the song Amazing Grace. It was sung on a slave trip. Can you imagine? You're surrounded by all these people packed up together, and you just hear this hum. It was a hum. There were no words put to it. There was somebody else put words to it, but it started out as a hum. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you are on that slave trip, and you can hear the humming of the slaves. Thank you, Rochelle. And now please join me in welcoming Sunny Moyo, the mentor coordinator of the Black Law Students Association, and she'll be sharing with us a bit of why we celebrate Black History Month today and always, and why it's important. Thank you, Camille. Audre Lorde once said, in our work and in our living, we must recognize that difference is a reason for celebration and growth, rather than a reason for destruction. It is not our differences that divide us. 
It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. We have come together today to celebrate Black History Month and to honor the contributions of black alumni to Osgoode Hall, the legal profession, and the community at large. Today, we honor George E. Carter, class of 1948, who was the first Canadian-born black judge. The Honorable George Carter attended Osgoode Hall while working as a porter on trains because as a black man, that was the only job available to him at the time. A member of the Universal Negro, Improve Negro Improvement Association and a Garveyite, the Honorable George E. Carter continued his commitment to social change through his legal career and his instrumentality in the establishment of legal aid services in Ontario. We remember Lincoln Alexander, class of 1953. His legacy is one of a man who stood tall as Canada's first black member of parliament and lieutenant governor. The Honorable Lincoln Alexander was a great man whose journey into self-awareness became active, not in the halls of, life, of law school or as one of Canada's first black lawyers. Rather, he recalls a self-awareness awakening during his tour of the African continent in 1960. In his book, he writes, I became conscious of my blackness. I had come from a white world. In Africa, I was a black man and I was somebody. I began to stand tall. We remember Leonard Braithwaite, class of 1958, and Canada's first black parliamentarian. Mr. Braithwaite sur is survived by a legacy of service, evidenced through his service in the Royal Canadian Air Force, his commitment to civil rights, politics, law, and community service in Ontario. In particular, shortly after graduating and during his maiden speech at Queen's Park, Mr. Braithwaite called for the abolition of the 114-year-old law permitting racial segregation in Ontario schools. We honor the memories of those who came before us, and we remember their courage, perseverance, and strength. In remembering, I have found myself wondering what it must have been like for those for these great men to have walked through the halls and been the only black students walking through them. At a time when the climate of intolerance went far beyond the walls of the law school and manifests itself in the decisions of the court and society at large, these men found the courage to carve out a space in the halls of Osgoode and in the legal profession so that my colleagues and I could stand where we are today. Not only did they brave the halls of the law school alone, they were willing to enter into a profession alongside others who were prepared to defend and uphold explicitly racist laws. For example, in the late 1940s, the Ontario Court of Appeal upheld the validity of clauses found in an ownership deed stating that lands shall never be sold, assigned, transferred, leased, or rented to any person of the Jewish, Hebrew, Semitic, Negro, or colored race or blood it being the intention and purpose to restrict the ownership and enjoyment to persons of the white or Caucasian race, not excluded by this clause. One need only walk through the halls of Osgoode and look at the composites on the walls of classes dating back to the early 1900s to gain a very clear picture of what the law school has looked like for most of its existence. Yet, walking through those same halls today, we can see that things have certainly begun to change. This year, Osgoode Hall welcomed a class of first year students that included 24 black students, creating the potential for the largest graduating class of black students in any Canadian law school since the class of 95, which graduated 16 black students. Today we have gathered to celebrate Black History Month, the contributions of Osgoode's black alumni, and the potential that we hold as future lawyers, lawmakers, and citizens of the world. We recognize and honor those who have struggled and stood tall so that we can be here today. We also recognize the challenge of the legacy of Justice Tulloch, the Honorable George Carter, Lincoln Alexander, Leonard Braithwaite, and the class of 95, and others present for us. They challenge us to remember not only the past, but to continue to recognize, accept, and celebrate the strength of our difference. Thank you. Thanks, Sunny. Please join me in welcoming the secretary of the Black Law Students Association, Jackie Kidun Kigundu.
thanks and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Camille said, I'm Jackie Kigundu, and I'm a third year law student here at Osgood. And I'm so honored to represent the Black Law Students Association and present this memorial book to the family of Lincoln Alexander. I think it's important that we take a moment to reflect on all that Link accomplished in his long and extraordinary lifetime. Lincoln Macaulay Alexander was born here in Toronto in 1922. When he was 20 years old, he began his service in the Royal Canadian Air Force, remaining with them until 1945. He went on to receive a Bachelor of Arts at McMaster University in 1949 and graduated from Osgoode Law School in 1953. He achieved the prestigious designation of Queen's Counsel in 1965. As a lawyer, Link became a partner of the firm Miller, Alexander, Tokiwa, and Isaacs. Making partner is the pinnacle of success for many lawyers, but Link pushed himself further and sought public service. Link was elected to the House of Commons in 1968, and so he became Canada's first black member of parliament. Link enjoyed the re-election in his Hamilton riding several times before eventually stepping down in 1980 to serve as chair of the Workers' Compensation Board. In 1985, Link was appointed Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Here, he blazed another trail as the first black person in Canada to hold this position. While many of us imagine the, choir, the, the quiet of retirement around age 70, at this time of his life, Link continued to push himself further. After leaving office, he served as chancellor of the University of Guelph for five terms, the longest in the school's history. The Law Society of Upper Canada elected him as an honorary bencher in 1992, and he was also appointed a Companion of the Order of Canada and to the Order of Ontario. After leading this magnificent life, Link passed away in October 2012. We students and faculty at Osgoode gathered here in this very room to remember this great man and to recall why every step we take in our own careers is in part thanks to him. I'd like to now draw upon some of those reflections that I shared at that time. Because for many of us here at Osgoode, Link's life is a lesson and he showed us what it truly means to give back to his community and to his country. I know that we're all here at Osgoode today in our multitudes of diversities because of trailblazers like him. When I think of Link, I, like Sunny, I wonder what his first day of Osgoode was like. I, I think we all feel isolated at law school sometimes, and I can only imagine how lonely it would have been to have been a black student in 1953. There's no doubt that Link experienced racism within this institution as a lawyer, uh, in, during his public service, and really all throughout his remarkable career. Shortly after Link's passing, my friend and colleague Jonathan Thompson and I were talking, and, and he reflected that the year Link graduated from law school, it was still possible to deny entry into Canada on the basis of unsuitability due to climate. These four words prevented immigrants of color from entering this country. At the same time, other choice words used by employers, landlords, and members of the general public throughout the country prevented black persons and other minorities from accessing jobs, accommodation, and even movie theater seats. The reason why Link is a legend is because of his ability to persist and transcend such obstacles and to bring people together while doing so. Like many other people in this room, I was never blessed with the opportunity to meet Link in person. But despite this, his, link, his legend speaks to all of us. And so from Link's extraordinary life, I take three lessons. The first is that the years that we spend as law students are really just the beginning of the greatness that we can release upon the world. If we make the choice to give back to our communities, we can continue our profession's tradition of being agents of positive change. The second is that it's extremely important to remember where we've been as individuals, as a school, and as a country. The divisive walls that exist between people are not a given, and they can be torn down with hard work and by continuously inspiring ourselves and others to do better and to be better than the status quo. The third is that the law is good, but that friends and family are everything. When Link spoke about his life, he always reflected on his late wife, his second wife, his children, and his grandchildren like Erica. 
and all of the other people who knew him outside of his professional self. This ought to remind us that even the most remarkable achievers have people in their lives that remind them of their humanity. And so on behalf of the Black Law Students Association and other members of the Osga community, I'm honored to give this memorial book to you, Erica. Thank you so much for coming and being part of our celebrations today. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is such an honor to be able to join you here today at Osgood Hall, where my grandfather attended law school. It is a wonderful feeling to know that he once spent much of his time studying here, uh, fulfilling his dreams. This is my first time at the school, so I'm feeling very blessed to be able to experience this all with you. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event during our Black Heritage Month and being able to be a part of recognizing other individuals who have worked so hard and given so much dedication to completing their goals and becoming an inspiration for others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. So in putting this event together, there were so many different alumni that we wanted to reach out to. And unfortunately, a number of them could not be here today because they're working. And so we actually put together a video just to document a little bit about um, what alumni, them reflecting just upon Black History Month and what Black History Month means to them. And then just speaking about some of the people that they look up to and also once again honoring some of our trailblazers. And that video was put together by Spencer Bailey, who's part of our graduating class. So if you could put a hand together for him and we can cue up the video. Black History Month is important because at least it gives us time to reflect on the past, the present, and hopefully on the future. Uh, I think Black History Month is not only important to the black community, but to the community at large. Because Black History Month is a period when the community at large can reflect on the extent to which it has lived up the principles of equality and acceptance and diversity on which it is founded. And this is the time when, quite frankly, we should reinvigorate ourselves to deal with those important questions as to whether, in fact, we have been able as a society to be able to deal with people on the basis of the contents of the character as opposed to the color of the skin. December the 14th, 1994, after much um, consensus building among my colleagues and among the different parties in the House, I stood up and this is what the motion that I put forward said. Mr. Speaker, um, with the unanimous consent of the House, I move, seconded by the Honorable Member for Quebec, the Honorable Member for Kootenay East, and the Honorable Member for Burnaby Kingsway that this house take note of the important contribution of black Canadians to the settlement, the growth, and the development of Canada, the diversity of the black community in Canada, and it's important to the history of this country. And I ask the house to recognize February as Black History Month. The legal profession is one area where we see uh, achievement, black achievement, and I think it is important for the community, and in particular younger people in the community, to see that achievement. Because if they can see others who look like them at that level, having achieved that success, 
then they can envisage themselves there. And I think that that is, is very important. And I see Black History Month as a time when we, the older people, can reach out to them, really take the time out to reach out to them, to educate them about the history, lest they forget, and be mentors to them for their goals and objectives that they are planning to take them forward into the future. There are, are many in the legal community I've looked up to. Um, uh, George Carter, um, I would say Lincoln Alexander, uh, Roy McMurtry. There are just many titans in our legal community that have just done so much for the profession, uh, above all for people. Uh, and uh, the late Leonard Braithwaite, who I believe was the first black member of the Ontario legislature, was a classmate of mine and a good friend. and. Uh, and I, my recollection is he was our class president, I think, through the whole four years, as it was in those days. The late Lincoln Alexander was also a, another very close friend, and uh, we saw a great deal of each other over the years. Now let me just tell you about this picture here. This is the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, who will be familiar to everybody. Link would always say, you know, anybody who knows Link, Link would always say, you know, that he would be introduced as the former Lieutenant Governor, the first uh, black member of Parliament, the first black cabinet minister, the first black uh, Lieutenant Governor, and so on and so forth, and all the things, the offices that he held. Then he'd say, but just call me Link, just call me Link, you see. So, and I always go by Link. So whenever we were together and we were friends for many years, he'd say, I'm Link and he's Wink, you see. In, in my experience, uh, Lincoln Alexander truly became one of the most beloved figures, public figures in the history of Ontario. And the tens of thousands of people who met, uh, met Link over the years, uh, each and every one of them, I'm sure, has a very positive, uh, happy uh, memory of, of meeting him. And he just, uh, he exuded warmth and, and personality and, and uh, graciousness and, and truly an outstanding public figure. And uh, although he died recently, uh, I, I already miss him very much and, and feel that I'm very fortunate to have known him for close to 50 years. stories, I think, that have been bound up in this institution and in our graduates and, and again reflecting on some of the uh, remarkable individuals, uh, especially uh, Lincoln Alexander, Leonard Braithwaite, who passed away in this last year, uh, were people who didn't wait uh, to, uh, you know, have their turn. Uh, they made uh, their turn happen by the force of their uh, passion, the compelling personality, the vision, the ambition, and the sense of initiative that uh, has really transformed lots of lives well beyond uh, their immediate circle. Uh, work hard, be prepared, uh, develop a niche area of expertise, take pride in your work, and uh, never stop learning, I guess. Uh, dream big and develop a plan to implement your goals, and if you can't do that, just go along for the ride. Happy Black History Month, Osgood. 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 Happy Black History Month to the Osgood community. I think you've done very well. You have furthered the cause of diversity, and you will continue to make a significant difference in the lives of students from all uh, sectors of our community. Congratulations. Thank you, Spencer Bailey, again, the producer of the video. And now please join me in welcoming Sean Knights to the stage. I'm usually not nervous with public speaking, but that is kind of intimidating. <laughs>
Um, but I just want to recognize and, and, and thank the Honorable Roy McMurtry, who has uh, come all the way from, uh, from downtown, uh, you know, and I know you have a very busy schedule, but I just want to recognize you and thank you for coming here today. It's a real honor for us to have you. It's my honor to talk to you today about the late, great Leonard Braithwaite. This is the first Black History Month that I have celebrated since his passing last April. I first met Leonard in 2004 when I read his bio online and decided to go search him out and visit his office. It was a meeting that would become a marked moment in my lifetime. Born in 1923, Leonard was a man that always bucked the trend. An entrepreneur at heart, he began his career selling newspapers after school in spite of his father's insistence that he not do it. Within a few years, Leonard was making more money than his father and bought his boss's rights to sell newspapers on certain street locations. And by the time he finished high school, he was employing seven people in his part-time paper selling business. He did much better than I did on my paper route. Now during World War II, Leonard refused to accept that he should not be allowed to serve in the Air Force. So in spite of regulations that pre prevented uh, blacks from serving outside of the Army, specifically the number two construction battalion, Leonard felt this was unfair since he wanted to be a navigator. He was good at mathematics and had achieved his grade 13, which at the time was much more rare. So in 1942, Leonard tried to join the Air Force and was told that he couldn't. Undeterred, Leonard went back the next month and asked again, and he was denied again. Then he went back, he was denied again. Then he tried Hamilton, the Hamilton recruiting office, and he was denied again. Then he tried Oshawa and was denied again. Leonard went back every single month for over a year until he was let in. Following the war, he came back and graduated from the University of Toronto at the top of his class with a commerce degree. And however, due to prevailing racist attitudes at the time, he was unable to get a job. So, like most of us who are unable to get a job, we go to law school. <laughs> and uh, so Leonard Braith Braithwaite graduated from Osgoode Hall in 1958 was one of the top students in his class and was elected as the first bl black president of Osgood's Legal and Lit Society. It's pretty cool checking out the old yearbooks and, and, and seeing what was happening at the time. In spite of his successful law student career, Leonard could not find an articling position. At the time, again, prevalent racist attitudes prevented blacks from working on Bay Street and most black law graduates had to compete to article for a handful of black lawyers or on occasion, Jewish firms. That's why I'm so glad Janine Charles is here who's a, a black recruiter on, a, well, not a recruiter of blacks, but a, a black person who is a, a Bay Street recruiter and uh, has always been a, a source of inspiration to me. Now, Leonard eventually found an articling position and opened up shop as a lawyer in Etobicoke where he is still loved to this day. In addition to becoming a lawyer, he also became Ontario's first black MPP. Before there was Obama, there was Leonard. <laughs> Leonard was not a man that played race politics. In fact, there were very few black people living in, in his Etobicoke riding at the time when he won the election. As an MPP, he successfully lobbied the Ontario government of the day to end segregated schools in Ontario and introduce female pages into the legislature. What inspired me most about Leonard was his outlook on life. In spite of all the opposition and challenges he faced, he never saw the glass ceiling. He just kept on going and going and bucking it. He seemed immune to the conditioning that racism tries to impose on many of us. He knew that he could be the best and never settled for anything less. He knew that, he, he, he knew that uh, with boldness he could break barriers for he could break barriers and the barriers that he broke assisted people like the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, Jean Augustine, Zanene Akande, Marianne Chambers, Margaret Best, and Michael Couteau who all are, are, are former elected members who came after Leonard. 
Leonard was always very proud of his time spent at Osgood, and he represents just another member of our amazing alumni that serve as an inspiration and will continue to inspire generations to come. He has helped to inspire some of my mentors. Some of, some of them are here today, like Rocco Achampong, who is here today, who's running to be one of our MPPs. You can just wave over here for me or stand. Like Selwyn Peters, who's also here and who's known as, uh, as renowned as a human rights advocate. Or Mark Warner, who's beside him, uh, who, who is uh, a former politician, who I hope will be a future politician as well. All of these are Osgood grads, by the way. There are many more friends in this room, or uh, like Kevin King over here, who I think will be the next prime minister. You should look out for him. But as an Osgood community and as a society of legal practitioners, we have a very inspiring history. This school is named after former Chief Justice William Osgood, who was an important abolitionist and was instrumental with others like Lieutenant Governor John Simcoe Graves in assault against slavery laws in British North America. Their efforts helped to stem the spread of slavery in Canada in preparation for its abolition. But those are the people that are gonna be in the history books. There are many more, like Deloitte Davis, who was born into slavery in Maryland, but later escaped with his family through the Underground Railroad and grew up in what is now Windsor, Ontario. He later convinced his MPP, William Belfort, to introduce a law that would allow him to become a lawyer after passing the bar without articling, because no one would offer him articling, an articling position. And if you look, and if you, when you get, go out here at the year 1900, what you'll find is in the far right-hand corner a picture of his son, um, his son, who is Fred H. A. Davis, who was one of Osgood's earliest graduates after it became a law school. There are many others, such as Ethelbert Lionel Cross, the first black lawyer to practice in Toronto, who spoke out against attempts to expand the Ku Klux Klan in places like Oakville, Ontario, and successfully pressured the Attorney General of Ontario to prosecute local KKK leaders. He advocated for people who had no access to justice, such as blacks, Jewish people, and the trade union communities in the 1930s. Myrtle Blackwood Smith, who graduated from Osgood in 1959 and was the first known black female lawyer in Ontario. I say this all just so that we understand that Black History Month is an opportunity to celebrate the unyielding nature of hope. The legacy of African peoples in North America says that you can be born into slavery and end up like Robert Sutherland as a lawyer, a reeve, and an inspiration. This legacy says that even if an unjust state law is against you, that you can change it because nothing is impossible for those who have faith and hope. So on behalf of the, on, on behalf of the, uh, the Black Law Students Association, I just want to say happy Black History Month. And, uh, and let's just remember that we come from an amazing history of people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. That's a bit of a hard act to follow, and I thank God I don't have to. I would like to welcome Yvonne Reed from the class of 2013 to the stage to discuss the accomplishments of the Honorable George Carter. Good afternoon. It's my uh, pleasure today to introduce the documentary, or a segment from the documentary, The Making of a Judge which is a daughter's tribute, um, Linda Carter's tribute to her father, George Carter, the first Canadian-born black judge in the province of Ontario. The movie explores the life of her father from uh, a young man born into an immigrant family in Ontario. His youth in uh, a small but tight-knit black community centered around Marcus Garvey's United Negro Improvement Association, which at the time had a very strong presence in Ontario. Um, his uh, struggles as a law graduate, finding work, and his, um, his, his triumph, his success, and eventual appointment by the Honorable Roy McMurtry as the first Canadian-born black judge in the province of Ontario. Um, this story is truly inspiring. There are a few characters, unfortunately, like the Honorable George, George Carter, 
and he provides a tremendous example for black law students like myself. His uh, accomplishments and triumphs uh, provide inspiration that is so very important in, uh, in this experience. And um, I, I hope that uh, the very short segment that we're about to see will provide inspiration to some of you also. Uh, thank you. Back in the 30s when George and, and uh, I and all, we were known as colored people. You have to remember when we went to school, there wasn't a person of color in any office in all of Canada. There were only about, say, maybe 1,000 to 1,500 colored people in all of Toronto. So there weren't very many in the area. George was head of the family and very bossy. It was very difficult for him to accept the fact that he had these five very strong sisters. He had six, but the five of us were home at that time. Daddy had all the, uh, a lot of books that he read. He was very well read. And he wanted to be a lawyer. And the fact that he had all of us, he never got to be one. But he had a tremendous mind. And I think he just sort of passed it on to uh, George to do this thing that he really wanted to do. So he was very pleased about that. Law. I was going to go law. I was going to be a lawyer. Period, eh? And I went and studied at Oscar because I'd heard of this great law school. Oscar, after the being serving in the army, and I get in there late for the first year. It's October now. I went in there, and the first over 400 students, and as I said, somebody conference of black lawyers. I says, I looked around in there and I says, there wasn't one brother in there. I had to start my humble beginnings. So I started to do work for others, eh? I mean, a lot of these lawyers were making money in the real estate. They didn't want to go to court. So they give me the court work, you see? And that's way I became very skilled at the rules of practice and the laws of evidence. I found that if you could do the work, they didn't care what color you were. When he uh, got his judgeship, it was such a fabulous day. We celebrated. So we all loved him. We were very proud it was of so him. So beautiful. And when we, uh, you know, got the uh, cards with the Honorable George Carter, and I showed everybody in New York, and they said, "Your brother's a judge." And then they said, "Oh, sure." <laughs> but it was wonderful. Yeah. It was really exciting. You don't sit on the bench unless you have some achievement. Certainly not in Ontario. You're not called to the bar as a black person unless you have the ability. I mean, it just doesn't happen, even today. But you might well understand back then when he was called to the bar, what it took for an individual, a black man, to be called to the bar and to be accomplished. And somebody who didn't just say, well, you know what, I deserve it. He got there and served very humbly. I would now like to welcome Miss Linda Carter to the stage. Good afternoon, and happy Black History Month. When I was growing up, we didn't have such a thing. There was no such thing as Black History Month, and it's so wonderful because at least once a year, you get to see certain number of people. You know, the gentleman, when you were talking about my father, he is truly a character. He really is a character, and he was the hardest person doing this documentary. I had so many wonderful people to interview. First, I interviewed Mr. McMurtry, thank you very much for your interview. And Leonard Braithwaite and Lincoln Alexander came up together. And they were the easiest people to work with. Dad was the hardest person to work with. Up to today, will you get to come with me? No. Well, needless to say, he didn't make it. I just want to thank you very much for your 
you know, for acknowledging the um, documentary. And I look forward to showing it to the whole student body another time. So I've gone on with the documentary, and you know, it's, it's so true. We talked about the history, and it's, I'm so glad that you've been looking into the history, because that's some of the things that I found when I was doing this documentary. Toronto now is multicultural. Big word, multicultural. When my father went to Osgood, he was the only one in the graduating class of Osgood. He was the only one out of 400. Even when I went to school, I was always the only one. No, I did not go to Osgood, unfortunately. He still holds that over my head, but that's beside the point. You know, but it's so important that we know our history, we know where we came from. My dad, that's why I had to do the documentary, because of stories that he would tell. I said, if I don't do it, they're going to be lost. He talked about when Marcus Garvey would come to Toronto and that the um, RCMP would come out with um, on horses, you know, to, to stop him from speaking because they thought that he was such a threat. My mother got his his autograph, so I have Marcus Garvey's autograph at home someplace. I know exactly where it is. And also, I've gone on to do a bust of my dad. Um, very short story. I was at the doctor's office. She was, um, my doctor was finishing her practice and I was sitting in the office with an older lady and we started talking about what we're doing. Turns out that she was one of the top sculptors in the country, Marion Kantorov. And she said, well, you should do a sculpture of your father. It's like, okay, I never, never thought of it. Teacher's guide maybe, but never a sculpture. So that's the latest thing that we're working on. And I believe it's going to be held right here at Osgood. So that, I mean, so that you can see who went before. Dad would be so proud to see so many faces of those that have come after him. He's still here, he's still very strong, and hopefully he'll be here when we do the unveiling of the bust. Okay, thank you very much. Bronze is coming. <laughs> but thank you so much for, uh, to Miss Linda Carter for joining us today. So as a student, oftentimes we read about the accomplishments of great men and women who were the first MPs or MPPs, the first to walk these halls. And I feel particularly privileged to live in a time when there's still a first and when I get to meet him and provide him with, with an award for his accomplishments. I'm deeply privileged to be part of this process today because we're here making history and we're all witnesses to that process. To Justice Tulloch, I speak on behalf of all black law students when I say thank you for persevering, for working hard, for your diligence, and for your fixity of purpose. What you have accomplished is far more than just for you, for your children, or just for your family. It's for the greater community, not just the black community, but for the greater community of Toronto, Ontario, and Canada as a whole. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome the president of Ryerson University, Mr. Sheldon Levy, to the stage, please. Well, uh, it's an honor to be asked to the stage, and uh, it's uh, like coming home for me, I have to say. As you heard from Mom Dushukri, I spent uh, oh, 25 years here. Uh, your Honor, it's great to see you, uh, Mr. McMurtry. Uh, Justice Tulloch, great to see you. Dean Sawson, great to see you. Mary J. Mossman, wonderful to see you. Rocco, wonderful to see you. 
everyone wonderful to see you. I got lost coming here. Uh, when I was here, uh, there was no Vary Hall. In fact, uh, if you go way back, I don't know exactly what year, but uh, this young man was in my mathematics class, and it's probably maybe 150 yards or quarter of a mile or meters from here where Michael and I first met. I was teaching mathematics, and Michael was in my class. That goes way, way back. Uh, Michael uh, worked in student records, as I recall, and I met someone else who was in student records here. And uh, we made a bondage of it. Now, the big surprise for most everyone is to, to learn the truth that Michael's my son. <laughs> now, uh, I, have, I, I have to tell you how that, uh, how that happened. One day, it was probably around December the 24th, somewhere around that, I bumped into Michael, and we would stay in touch. And I said to Michael, what are you doing out? You should be with your family. And I think you had two children at the time. Uh, not quite sure if it was two or three at that time, but he was out on December 24th, and he was, he was now a lawyer practicing law. And uh, he said, well, I got this to do and that to do. And I said, well, aren't you at home with the family with the Christmas tree and all of that stuff? He said, no, I didn't have time to get it. Telling stories out of town. <laughs> In any event, I said to Michael, whatever you're doing, you're going to stop. We went to my house and we got a Christmas tree. We brought it to his house. We put the lights on it and celebrated Christmas. And from then on, I was his dad. Uh, I remember getting the call when Michael was called to the bench, and I think uh, it was uh, uh, an evening, and Michael phoned uh, the house, and he told me uh, that he's being asked uh, to serve on the court. What did I think? And I said, what do I think? I think you're going to say yes, is what I think. And he knew he was going to say yes, because from that day and the days before, Michael saw that his uh, destiny, his reason for being, was bigger than just himself, but it was for his community. I remember when he was sworn in. It was great timing, because he was sworn in uh, the day after uh, Dalton McGinty, it's interesting today, a cabinet is being sworn in, and it was the, cap, the original cabinet of Dalton McGinty was sworn in, and Michael invited myself and Mary, uh, Marianne Chambers to uh, be at the ceremony. Now, talk about perfect timing. I had to meet the uh, new minister of training colleges and universities, and I met her at the, the swearing-in ceremony. So it was great timing. And I remember when uh, Michael and I uh, went around the court and he was introducing me to the different judges. And you could imagine their expression. We had opened the door and he'd say to Judge XYZ, I want you to meet my father. In any event, it was a very proud, a proud day. And now uh, Michael is being sworn in again on February 26. And, uh, and I will be there with my wife to see our son sworn in. And I can't even begin to tell you how proud I am of him. Uh, there's so much to say. Michael's and my path go uh, zigzagging across. They go to uh, meeting his, one of his sons in my backyard who had, was about two years old and swung a baseball bat like uh, a pro to meeting one of his sons as he was considering university and made a choice didn't say the right choice, but made a good choice nonetheless, and uh, soon to meet uh, another one of his sons and his daughters. But uh, with all of his accomplishments uh, that Michael has had and his leadership to be the first uh, in, in black uh, Canadian to serve as an appeals court judge, all of that is uh, important, but what is even more important is Michael as a person. 
He uh, gives all the time, and in fact, right after this uh, event, uh, there's a new uh, uh, crown in town, and uh, Michael is uh, meeting him and I for dinner just to help him out. That's the typical type of person Michael is. So whether it's coming back to the university and being here, uh, what makes me most proud of all is to say that my son has done well, that he has represented his community well, he will represent Canada well, and Canada is a heck of a lot better place because of people like Michael, my son. Thank you. Thank you, President Levy. Truly touching words. Please join me now in welcoming Mr. Andrew Nunes of Faskin Martineau de Moulin LLP and of the Osgood class of 1999. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I promise you that I will be brief. I find it very appropriate that Sheldon Levy found it right and proper to speak more about Michael in his personal capacity than to dwell on the achievements. And today I'm going to continue along the same vein. Um, I have the distinct pleasure to be able to say that I have known Justice Tulloch for my entire life. And as a result of that, I have had an opportunity to watch him and to watch his character. Not just his achievements, but the opportunity to observe the man who is ob obtaining this award today. And I would say that as much as we are here to witness him receiving this award today, we could just as easily be here speaking about his character and the person who he is. I know Justice Tulloch quite well. He's basically family to me and to my family. And I've known him always to be someone who is extremely genuine. I know him to be someone who is extremely grounded. I know him to be someone who is extremely giving. And I know him to be someone who is extremely unselfish. He certainly is someone who is sincerely concerned, motivated, and dedicated to making this world a better place. When you look at someone's achievement, in my view, achievement is good, but that achievement should be discounted where the person does not have the character, the good character, to back that up. But fortunately this afternoon, Justice Tulloch is the type of person where we don't have to make such a discount. He is the type of person for anyone or who anyone would be proud to be a role model to their children. And today I'm extremely proud to know and to be associated with him, to have him been an influence in my career, in my life, to have been a mentor to me. I wanna say thank you on behalf of myself and to the entire, from the entire community at large. Michael, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. And Justice Tulloch, there were many well-wishers who couldn't make it here today, and they've sent their congratulations by video. He is um, one of the most down-to-earth people you'd ever meet, want to meet, as well as a, a very brilliant lawyer. Um, it, it was a little surprising because, you know, it's the first black judge appointed to a court of appeal, but then when you stop and think about it, he's the perfect person for the, for the role. The newest appointment, or one of the newest appointments of the Court of Appeal, Michael Tulloch, we're looking at 
younger generation, but I think Michael is a, uh, an enormously talented judge, and, and I've enjoyed our friendship over the in recent years, and I'm delighted to see him become the first uh, black uh, appointee uh, to the Court of Appeal in Ontario. He is an extreme individual. Uh, he is. He's not like the rest of us. <laughs> um, he's, he's super brilliant, super caring. Uh, he can see steps ahead and think things through to a, a level where, uh, well beyond where most of us stop. That's, that's my impression of him. He's an extremely hard worker. Um, seeing how hard he works makes me tired. And, you know, we all work pretty hard. And he's just in another category. I was very excited to hear that uh, Justice Tullock was appointed to the Court of Appeal and I wish to extend him my utmost congratulations and I look forward to seeing what he produces on that bench. I should tell you about my first meeting with Justice Tullock. I first met Justice Tullock at the program for new judges when he was appointed to the Superior Court. He and I flew back to Toronto on the same airplane. We had seats again together. So I had this big long day of first the, 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 the course, whatever it was, the class. And then this, I traveled all day with Michael. So I got to know him really well during the course of the day. That was our, the, make, the, the making of our friendship. And we became very good friends that day. And uh, you know, I really, really liked him. I just thought he was a wonderful guy. I thought he would make a, a huge contribution uh, to, the, to the court. And uh, you know, so we've had lots of things to do with each other over the years, and we're very good personal friends, and I'm just delighted that he's here. I was gratified that someone uh, from, from our community, and um, one with whom I, I went to school, um, was, you know, elevated to such a significant rank in our noble profession. In, in the black community, when we succeed, it is such a light to young people uh, behind us. And that has instilled a lot of pride in, in young people that when they, they look at the courts, the legal system that's basically at the apex of, of all institutions in this country, that there is somebody, a black person, in sitting on the Court of Appeal, it, it is a great thing. And, and that is what drives a whole lot of us. The, the example that we, we shed, um, that we show for other young students. Uh, Justice Tullock, uh, you've probably heard this a million times from a number of different people, but uh, no less, it's worth saying again, congratulations on such a great achievement. We're very, very, very proud of you. All the people who I know who know you are very, very, very proud of you. Um, you've done an excellent job, and uh, we expect and look forward to seeing the great things that you will continue to achieve in the future. Um, uh, Justice Tullock, um, uh, I think what you've achieved is a, is, is a significant milestone. I think it reflects very well on our community. I think it has given hope to many persons that aspiring to be judges or to be judges in high courts in our land um, is an attainable goal. And I think you will serve with distinction and I think you will be a fine ambassador not only for our community but for Canada at large. Congratulations. So we're here to present the inaugural, the Honorable Alexander Lincoln 53 Award to the Honorable Michael Tulloch. This award is created, was created after the sculpture by Gino Cavicchioli, who traveled all the way down here today. So thank you so much and thank you for your tireless work on creating this amazing, amazing award. So.
So if we can keep clapping, we're going to welcome Justice Tulloch to the stage. Wow, <laughs> um, absolutely honored uh, to be here. Um, you know, uh, I'm also very touched. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I want to thank uh, uh, my dad, Sheldon Levy, <laughs> uh, as well as Andrew Nunes, who I count as a brother, and I've known Andrew from he was born. <laughs> Um, for the heartfelt introduction. I want to thank Dean Lauren Sawson and Osgood Hall Law School as well as uh, York University uh, for hosting uh, this Black History Month event as well as uh, for uh, participating in the presentation of this award. I want to thank the Black Law students um, before the black law students, um, also the Honorable uh, Chief Justice, <laughs> still my Chief Justice in a law in a huge way, Roy McMurtry, for coming, Roy. Thank you. To the law students, um, you guys are incredible, and uh, I want to thank you. Um, when I was here, uh, back in the 1980s, there were only three of us that were black uh, in our class. And so we didn't have the numbers to, to have an organization such as this. So your presence here is evidence of the progress of uh, not only our community, but also of um, this great country, Canada. You know, I'm certainly honored to be receiving an award in the name of Lincoln Alexander. Um, he's a great trailblazer. Um, he is a giant on whose shoulders all of us in this room stands. And um, I too want to pay tribute to him. I want to pay tribute to all the other uh, trailblazers such as Len Braithwaite, and uh, George Carter. Without them, I know my path would be a lot more difficult. You know, it is indeed an honor to be back here uh, and to be joined by so many of my friends. I see Barbara Lynch in the back. We work together uh, here at York. Uh, also, um, Anita Herman. We all worked together when I was a student uh, in the admissions office for York University. And Barb subsequently became a, a lawyer and she was an article and student in my law firm. So it's a real honor to have you here, Barb. It's as well, it is always great to come back uh, to Osgoode Hall Law School. It's a place that is dear to my heart as it was in these halls and these seminar rooms that my legal career began. Although it has been over 20 years since I've graduated from the school, it still in many ways feels like yesterday. This law school is one of the top law schools in North America, probably one of the top law schools in my view uh, in the world. You know, and those of us who have had the good fortune to have been admitted and to have attended this law school 
have had an intellectually enriched and invigorating legal education, which has prepared us well for life outside of Osgood, as well as for a fulfilling and exciting legal career. That's a tradition, it's a tradition of excellence. And we can see that with the trailblazers who have all graduated from this great institution. They all sat in the seats that you and I have sat, and they all have been exposed to the legal education that we have, expo have been exposed. And, uh, but for, uh, you know, the incredible education that they got from this place, that you and I have experienced, and the generations to come who pass through these halls will experience. They would not have been able to accomplish what they have accomplished. Each of those trailblazers, they have changed the landscape of this great country, and they have made Canada a better place. It's a better place not only for us, but it's a better place for the world. Canada is seen as a beacon of hope to not only North America, but to people the world over. And so it is a place that is the envy of the world, the envy of people who are in other parts of the world that are experiencing all sorts of atrocities, who try to come here to make you know, their lives a better place for them and for their children. I still remember my first week at Osgood in August of 1986 and how daunting the years ahead seemed. The period of the 80s was during the height of a recession. I had just recently graduated with a degree in economics. Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States. Brian Mulroney was the Prime Minister of Canada. David Peterson had just become Premier of Ontario the first liberal premier in 42 years following 14 year, the 14-year reign of uh, Premier Bill Davis, one of the greatest education premiers that this province have ever had. And a brief five and a half month uh, stint by Frank Miller. Unfortunately, our good friend, Roy McMurtry, was not the premier. You're the best premier we never had. <laughs> But anyway, it was a time that was known then in economic terms as stagflation, which was high unemployment and high interest rates. The interest rates were as high as 15% at the time. Life at Osgood at the time was, more, was also reflective of its time. The environment here was politically charged, but also very progressive. It was a time when legal jobs were scarce and the employment prospect post-law school uncertain. The prevailing message at the time was that the law schools were graduating too many lawyers in Ontario. And it was a time when there were not many blacks or visible or other visible minority law students. But in spite of our numbers, we had faculties. And I thank you, uh, Mary Jane Mossman, who is here. Uh, who was our associate dean of law at the time, and many others who were like her, who supported us and ensured that we did not feel alienated or isolated from the wider student body. And in spite of the challenges of the time, we were full of hope and promise. It was a time of apartheid in South Africa and when Nelson Mandela was still in jail, but a time when a number of us were able to become politically engaged and to create a society here at Osgood called the Nelson Mandela Law Society. We were able to work with other students across Canada and North America and Europe to engage this university's administration and the administration of many other Canadian and American universities in dialogues about the need to divest out of South Africa and side with the anti-apartheid movement to put pressure on the South African apartheid government to put an end to their regime 
and respect and protect the human rights and dignity of black South African. We here at Osgood were part of that. And this institution was very much instrumental in the dismantling of apartheid South Africa. You know, during my years here, I was able to participate in the invitation to Osgood of international legal luminaries, such as Albie Sachs, who at the time was a member of the ANC executive and who subsequently became one of the first judges and architects of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. My time here at Osgood was very memorable. And to a large extent, my legal career here, the friendships and acquaintances that I de developed here most definitely helped shape my legal career and my passion for the law and my commitment to human rights and, and adherence to the rule of law. It is also a great honor for me to be receiving an award named after the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, someone who I also came to know in his later years and someone who I called a friend. You know, <clears throat> as we celebrate uh, Black History Month during this month, and I'll just divert a little bit. You know, Link, he was the, um, he was the chair of the uh, Raptors uh, Foundation, and you know, he was always at the Raptors game when he was in good health. And when I was practicing law and I had a little bit more money than I do now, <laughs> I had, um, I, I had some season's tickets at the Raptors. So, you know, we'd often um, meet down there. And, um, you know, he was the most engaging and um, affable uh, human being that you could ever uh, meet. Um, he is someone, when I first became a judge, you know, he never called me Michael after that. He says, you know, the judge, the judge. And, uh, you know, he was just a very warm, human being. So it's a real honor uh, to be able to receive this award in his name. You know, it is important for us to remember and reflect on the lives of great Canadians such as Lincoln Alexander, who notwithstanding the fact that he was black and was born during a period of heightened racial tension and discrimination, through a commitment to higher education as well as hard work, dedication and perseverance, he became a key figure in Canada's history, a man who led the way for black participation in Canadian public life. In a very real sense, each of us that are here and that are black, who are studying law or who have studied law and are now members of the legal profession in Ontario, whole a deep sense of gratitude to people like Lincoln Alexander, uh, to people like uh, George Carter, and to people like uh, Len Braithwaite, uh, who were able to notwithstand the, ba the, the barriers that they endured, they were able to break them down, and we can now look forward to becoming a part of this noble profession. Lincoln Alexander was the first black person to become a member of parliament, the first to be named as a cabinet minister, and the first to be appointed as lieutenant governor of any provinces in Canada. He was the fifth black member of the Bar of Ontario, the longest serving university chancellor in Canadian history, and a lifelong champion of the importance of education. You know, Link wrote a biography entitled, Go to School, You're a Little Black Boy. The title reflects his, his mother's words to him as a child. And in the power of education, his memoir credits his mother with the foresight, which went beyond her station as a maid, that education was the way to success. Link's mother taught him that being black meant you had to be three times as good as the others, especially at school. However, the road was not easy for Little Link. Throughout his entire education, from primary school to university, 
He was almost always the only black student in the class. Link claims he never allowed himself to be traumatized by any of the racism he encountered. Instead, he confronted that racism and demanded respect. As a child, this meant a lot of fistfights. Later on, of course, his methods would get a bit more sophisticated. Throughout it all, he kept up his, his grades and learned to get along with people, making them feel at ease, a skill that would prove very useful in his future career. Now, because of time constraints, I cannot go too much deeper into his life, but you know, each of the, the speakers who have spoken earlier, you know, they added a different dimension, or they went into a different dimension of his uh, public service. But I would encourage each of you to read his memoir so that you can understand the importance and value of his contributions uh, to this great country. Now, as a child, he had a rather difficult life. His parents split when he was 15 years old. He and his mother moved to Harlem to live, which was not a very good experience for him. Link was the only black youth on a street to attend school. He lived in a violent area full of crime, dis despair, and blatant racism, an area that the larger city had no interest in helping to improve. However, he did notice those few individuals who managed to get themselves out of that lifestyle and pursue various professions, most of which he did not ever contemplate. But he could get, but he could, but before he could get too caught up uh, in the environment of Harlem, his mother smartly sent him back to Canada to sign up for the draft as World War II had begun. Now we heard about the difficulties that uh, Len Braithwaite had in being, you know, I mean, someone, this is someone who gave themselves up to basically, you know, say, shoot me, I'm a target, right? To, 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 to serve for their country, but because of the state of uh, racism at that particular time, the institution of the army and the institution of the uh, military would refuse them from, from becoming a part. But notwithstanding, um, through perseverance, Link as well was able to join the Royal Canadian Air Force and he served from 1942 to 1945 as a wireless operator in Hamilton and Portage La Prairie in Manitoba. He rose to the rank of corporal. Now, he made close friends and kept challenging racism wherever he found it. After the war, he returned to Hamilton got married and he started a family. He also enrolled at McMaster's University where he graduated with a BA in political economy. While all of the university graduates were being snapped up by local employers in white collar jobs, Link was unable to secure a job after graduation as no one wanted a black man in their sales department. So he decided to follow his friend John Miller to Osgoode Hall Law School. During law school, he and his wife Yvonne struggled financially, living with her parents as they relied on her work in a laundromat and uh, his veterans' benefits. But he persevered and stayed near the top of his class. Even in such a precarious position, Link did not hesitate to stand up in his last year of law school and challenge the dean of the law school at the time when he made a racist remark in class. In his life, Link never allowed anyone to intimidate him and never allowed such comments to go unchallenged. Link was called to the bar of Ontario, as we've heard, in 1953. At that time, he was the fifth black man in Ontario to be called. His article in position demonstrated the intersection of black history with the histories of many different groups of Canadians. 
At the time, the big law firms did not want to hire blacks, women, Jews, or other minorities. In response, several Jewish lawyers had opened their own small practices. Most were sympathetic to the treatment of other minorities. And thus, it was through that that Link came to article with Sam Got Gottfried, QC. Now, during this time, he seemed to lack confidence. He felt reticent to fully stand up and be counted, counted due to his minority status. But he soon got over that hesitation and went back to acting confidently. After his articles and his call to the bar, while in the process of applying for a job as a lawyer, at the end of a phone interview with a lead in law firm in Hamilton, a call, a call which he perceived had gone very well. He asked the partner, would it matter to you, sir, if I told you that I was black? The partner hesitated and um, he agreed to still meet with him. But after meeting, he refused to give him a job on the basis that his clients would not accept a black lawyer. Link continued on, disillusioned but determined, and instead found reward in work with a law firm run by a Ukrainian brother and sister who were capable of hiring Link based on his merits and not his race. He later joined David Duncan, an open-minded and prominent white lawyer with whom he eventually formed a partnership. Once Duncan left, Link had great difficulty in maintaining a solo practice. At the time, minority lawyers were having trouble getting even members of the same minority groups to hire them. People weren't yet convinced they were capable of doing the job. Further evidence of the power that negative stereotyping has on people's perception of their own racial identity. His old friend John Miller changed this pattern by entering into partnership with Link. Their firm became known in Hamilton as the United Nations as they added Paul Takiwa, a Japanese man, and Peter Isaacs, an Aboriginal lawyer. They had not set out to do so, but they were making history. Link's story is not only a story for Black History Month. His story is woven into the fabric of Canada's past, present, and future as an enduring example of public service, integrity, and courage that will inspire many generations to come. Link would not have been able to do all of this alone. Along the way, people of every ethnic origin Afro-Caribbean, Jewish, Ukrainian, Anglo-Saxon, Aboriginal, and more helped him and guided his journey. And I must say that that is also my story. You know, I am black, but I've been assisted by many people outside of the black community. Many of my mentors are people like Roy McMurtry, Sheldon Levy, uh, people who have a sense and respect for the humanity of us all, regardless of the color of our skin. What they do is they look at the content of our character. And that is a story that must also be told because our, black his our history is inextricably tied to the history of others. And what is really important is that we understand and that we convey to our children and to the generations to come that we can be a stronger people when our color no longer matters, right? And that is what life is all about. And that is why each of you are here as ambassadors of a greater message. And you know, you're getting a, an amazing education and link you know, he represented that. And just the same way he was a great ambassador of his generation, each and every one of you and us will be too. 
I certainly know that I, am the fir I might be the first to be appointed to the Court of Appeal of Ontario, but I will not be the last that is black. And I look forward uh, to the day when our color is not really a factor to be even be considered or to be looked at. You know, they will just, it will be, you know, just like business as usual. A great lawyer got appointed to the court. And that is how Link is now viewed. In his way, Link's story reminds us that black history is not a separate history. We're all here sharing the same space and creating history together, whether through intolerance and hate or through trust and friendship. Reflecting on Link's life, he acted in the belief that our commonalities outweigh our differences at a time when many people did not feel that way. He represented the region of Hamilton West for 12 years alongside hundreds of other MPs, advocating for positive change for his constituents and focusing on principles shared by all Canadians. Like the importance of education, he acted as if he lived in an equal society, in equal opportunities for all, and in doing so, he and his contemporaries began to bring that reality into existence. Now, Link reflected in his memoir that his experiences left him determined to be as good as he could be, to not be afraid to break ground or be intimidated by the overwhelming responsibility, and to not accept that his color should inhibit his opportunities. Racism is a factor that each and every one of us will, if we have not yet experienced, certainly experience but it should not define you, your color shouldn't define you, and it should not in any way inhibit your, your, your reach. It shouldn't inhibit or in any way stifle your growth. Like Lincoln Alexander, I think we can all agree that he succeeded in these goals and ensured his permanent place in the annals of Canadian history. Now, I want to thank you for celebrating his life with me today and for awarding me this award in his name. It is indeed a great, a great honor. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we have uh, so, um, so many people uh, who came together today to make this uh, possible and um, I want to thank all the uh, speakers, all the organizers, the planners, those who uh, came out today. Of course, uh, Justice um, uh, Tullock and uh, it's a day like this where it's hard to um, uh, not uh, feel great pride uh, to be a part of Osgoode, to be a part of York. Uh, and again, I can't think of a, a day or an occasion that better reflects uh, our values and aspirations. And as uh, Justice Tullock said, uh, I think uh, our future is in remarkably good hands and will be as long as we don't forget uh, our past and the bonds that connect us. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to uh, move over to the uh, JCR just um, across uh, the, uh, the hall and hope that uh, some of you can stay and enjoy uh, the, um, uh, the sense of uh, our bright future and our rich past uh, and uh, join us in celebrating Justice Tullock and all those from Balsa who put together today. So thanks again and look forward to seeing you at the reception. <laughs>